Um, and thanks for coming along this evening. Um, it's nice to be uh, talking about something other than the opinion polls for, for a change. Um, but another um, tried and tested topic um, uh, for social statistics section is uh, response rates. Um, and <coughs> increasingly uh, questioning uh, the amount of resource and effort uh, and cost that goes into uh, uh, main hopefully maintaining um, high response rates. So um, <coughs> uh, we know, of course, that response rates have been going down. Um, here's a, I've always feel a bit, a bit, bit um, sorry for my Nats N former colleagues here when I put this chart up. I'm not picking on, on Nats N and the British Social Attitudes survey. Um, but um, it, it does have the benefit of having had a, you know, there's a, a long time series and a, a fairly consistent methodology in the same place doing it and so on. So uh, we know that this is, it, you know, um, a, uh, a good source of uh, understanding response rate trends in, in, in the UK. So this is uh, from 90 1996 uh, to uh, 2011, 2014. I'm told 2015's gone up a little bit, um, but um, it's a, a, a fairly downward trend and of course if you go sort of further back in time uh, prior to 1996 this was uh, uh, even higher uh, and there's a um, you know this is a consistent story across many different surveys both uh, in the UK uh, and internationally there's a couple of uh, meta-analyses done getting a little bit dated now I think um, that, that show uh, an international trend um, in this in the same direction I think actually uh, point of interest would be that I mean, there's some speculation about whether this has sort of plateaued a little bit um, as we've got down to the kind of 50% uh, level on, on the face-to-face -face, uh, survey. So it'd be interesting to sort of revisit this and see whether there's been any kind of uh, uh, tailing off in the decline. But nonetheless, um, it has been a, a story of declining response rates. And the other thing is, of course, that this isn't a sort of um, steady state um, because during this same period, um, fieldwork agencies have been devoting more and more resources um, to the same task, so uh, more money in, uh, spent in incentives, uh, more uh, callbacks, uh, more reissuing, and so on. So we're not, you know, this, this is despite all of those uh, additional efforts and, 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 and costs, the, uh, the trend is, is consistently down. And that's for, obviously, face-to-face um, -face surveys. I was just saying to to, to Joel Williams um, at the start of this, how we're kind of, you know, I certainly, in the UK, very kind of face-to-face, half-sample-centric when I think about surveys. And I think that, that's something that, that is changing now uh, in the UK. It's likely to change more in the future. And it is certainly less the case uh, internationally when you go to the States, uh, where, where phone surveys, random digit dialing phone surveys, have been uh, more the, the sort of staple uh, of the survey industry and they're actually I mean RDD uh, response rates even worse than this you know and, and now routinely uh, below 10% uh, uh, for general population RDD and we don't think we've really got equivalent uh, figures we don't tend to do uh, proper sort of dual frame uh, RDD very often in this country but I suspect the, the response rates would be not far different um, than this possibly even lower and that's getting even harder to do because of the you know, the, the new do not call legislation in the states, something like it's not impossible, that sort of thing could happen here. Uh, changing uh, mobile only uh, and, and dual line uh, households and so on, making that a kind of, you know, an unstable picture and difficult to, uh, to survey. Um, and so as this is happening, increasingly uh, survey commissioners um, are uh, asking what they're getting for their money. Um, and, um, you know, we, we often uh, hear this, particularly people, I think, you know, who haven't been um, through master's programs at Southampton and Essex um, and, and so on um, and, and don't understand necessarily the sort of what's under the, under the bonnet here. You know, the data set looks the same if I go to YouGov or if I go to uh, uh, NatSEN or TNS. What am I getting? You know, what, what is the, what's the added value um, when the cost differential um, is, is so en enormous? Um, and, and this other question, which is related, of course, is that, well, if the response rate is only 3%, is that any better than a well-designed quota sample, um, and which is, again, much cheaper? And 
this is all you know set against the the backdrop of the the increasing costs um, hard to say exactly uh, uh, what we're talking about here in terms of the the cost increase um, but I think it's, it's certainly the case that the per interview per achieved interview costs if we could standardize that in some way uh, have been are high and uh, increasing of course it depends what kind of a survey you're talking about um, but here's an example from again from the from the US it's a very long time series going back to the 1940s the national election study which is this kind of uh, canonical face-to-face uh, -face random survey uh, done in the US and so they're kind of you know, duty-bound to keep doing it um, but but in the, in the US face-to-face uh, -face survey costs are even higher uh, than they are much higher because you know if you if you draw a sample point in the middle of Wyoming um, you've got to you've got to fly an interviewer out there and put them up in a hotel for a couple of weeks hire a car for them and so on these are enormously expensive to, to do this compared to the to the UK so Simon Jackman who's the PI of that study uh, April last year he came up with this figure two thousand dollars per complete interview uh, in the ANES and there's, there's people, people uh, shaking their heads here right? so uh, that that is a little bit of a, a cheeky one because it, it, it's a pre and post so he was including two interviews there but still uh, you know it's a, it's a very high figure um, if we try and bring that to the UK context maybe that's a little little high but you know if we're talking about a uh, a face-to-face -face PAF sample, 45-minute interview, say 1,500 achieved interviews, response rate about 50%, topic kind of not too boring but not too interesting, um, maybe 200, 250 quid per achieved interview. That's a lot when you can go to YouGov and get a per achieved uh, per interview for about you know, a fiver um, or, 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 or even less perhaps. Um, and, and it's, I've been trying to sort of get a historical fix on this, and it's difficult. Um, and I, but I did come across, um, in the in the course of the polling inquiry, uh, a publication uh, into the 1970 uh, polling. If anyone remembers that, um, the uh, David Butler wrote a report uh, on that. And, and in, in a footnote in that report, he said, um, <coughs> for a random sample of three and a half, this is 1970, a random sample of three and a half thousand people. It would cost three and a half thousand pounds. Um, now, obviously, that's in that, that the money of those. But if you if you then went and updated that for RPI, uh, that's about fifty thousand quid. Uh, in 1970, so you could get a, a three, a three and a half thousand random survey for about fifty to sixty thousand quid. Um, so, things have got worse. We're spending a lot money, a lot more money, um, getting not quite the same thing. We're getting lower response rates uh, and and the like. So, why is this well? Uh, I think most of us are familiar with this, that the um, um, average, what the, dr the drivers of this, we're, we're, we're calling back uh, more often, uh, we're uh, re doing more refusal conversion, and uh, we're spending more on incentives, increasingly necessary to pay uh, incentives, not a sort of optional extra um, to get sort of even, you know, sort of what, what are considered minimally acceptable response rates. Um, on understanding society, uh, the, the, what, this is a sort of experimental condition, but um, 30 pounds is offered in, in, in some conditions there, and that, that may be the, the level that's necessary to, to maintain response rates in the, in the mixed mode uh, future for that survey. Um, so it's incentives, you know, with a large sample, that's a lot of money. Um, and here's a, here's a, a, a figure. Um, actually from, from Joel Williams um, who's going to be saying a little bit more about costs not specifically about this part of it but uh, um, you know, you're trying to, those, those 20% at the, at the end of the survey that you're trying to track down to get your response rate up to a respectable level maybe it's 30% you've got to get up to 50 that can, that can account for 30 to 40% of the, of the field work costs getting those people so the question that we're interested in here is is, is that worth it you know, could we could we perhaps uh, not bother spending that that chunk of the budget and just tolerate having a uh, a, a lower response rate? What does it do? Because obviously a response rate is only useful insofar as it's an indicator of the quality of the the survey, the error, uh, the bias. So is 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 that, that is that spend um, reducing the error? There's some other factors that we're worried about in this context. That um, you know, as we're pressuring people, we're calling back, calling back, to, you know. 
trying to convert people who've initially said they don't want to do the survey, uh, that we might actually be getting worse data. There's evidence of this that you know if we, we if we pay people high incentives or we sort of you know cajole them into doing it, then we get we get straight lining and uh, uh, satisficing and, and poor quality data. Um, you know fabrication possibly. Um, on, I've, I've referenced the community life survey there. There's some evidence there that, that moving to web um, to keep response rates up, you need to incentivize people, households. That provides an incentive to make up household members if you get £10 for each uh, uh, complete within a household. Uh, possibly pressure on, on interviewers to fabricate as well. So it's not just on, on the respondents. And then there, there are then some questions about you know, whether this is ethical to keep going back and, and trying to persuade people who've already told us that they don't want to do the survey. So there are, there are other uh, angles to this rather than just the sort of the pure cost one. But what we're focusing on uh, in, this, in this study that I'm going to tell you about um, is, is whether this is all worth it, is the effort and cost worth it of, of chasing them down. Um, and so the other uh, sort of angle on this that this work fits into is this uh, uh, body of work looking at the, the correlation between response rates and non-response bias. And here's quite a a famous, uh, well, famous in the in the small world of survey methodology, um, but well-known chart here from Bob Groves' 2006 paper in Public Opinion Quarterly, uh, and on the on the y-axis here, uh, we've got the uh, well, it's some kind of uh, relativized measure of bias, standard standard relativized, but you know, don't don't worry too much. But so higher values is more bias, basically, for for, for, for now, and then the, the response rate along the bottom here. Um, and you can see, so we've got a number of, you know, the same survey produces a number of different estimates. That's why the dots go up in, in lines here. But this is the, this is a high level, a high degree of bias for this particular estimate. So these are all surveys where you've got some kind of gold standard, you've got a criterion to measure the bias. Um, and what you can see here is that there isn't much of a correlation. So if, if, cor if, if it's the response rate went up, the bias went down, you'd expect the line of best fit to go through, go down here. It doesn't really work that way. There's much more um, variability within a survey with the same response rate than there are, is between surveys with different response rates. So there's, there, is, there is bias. We're not saying there isn't bias in the estimates. It's not strongly related to uh, um, response rate, though. OK, so there's some other studies that have looked at this same thing. Uh, in, in the States, um, the Edelman et al. Um, in, in the US, they released the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the votes at precinct level, the share of the vote at, at precinct level, so you can do an exit poll and, and look at the, the relate whether you've got, got the, um, the vote share right at the precinct level, do this across lots of precincts, and look at the correlation between the response rate to the exit poll and, and the bias in the, in the vote share. And again, they find no no correlation there. Um, and there are some there are some other studies that have done this. Um, they they find uh, uh, sorry. My last point there is that another another factor here is weak propensity models. We, we, if we're trying to predict non-response, we don't get very good predictive models. Maybe this tells us something about the nature of non-response that it's, it's it's somewhat kind of random. Um, so these are all interesting studies, and they tell us something about that, that maybe uh, non-response is uh, not strongly related to uh, uh, non-response bias is strongly related to uh, response rate. Their, their, their limitation is they're quite unusual studies. The Groves et al. study mostly small niche populations, health surveys, self-completion surveys, because uh, because you need to have this kind of goal. You need to have the true score, and that, that's quite rare. Apart from in these kinds of surveys. So, so we wonder about how general uh, these findings are. So this is our study. I finally got around to talking about the study that we're, uh, we're doing. This is with uh, Joel Williams, um, Ian Brunton-Smith and Jamie Moore, and it's part of uh, the uh, National Centre for Research Methods uh, research program. Uh, we've got a number of different uh, strands of that, and this is one that, that uh, Gabby is also going to be talking about in a moment um, on kind of, well, broadly uh, survey methodology. And the basic idea here, I'm just going to run through, there, there is a paper, by the way, and I'll give you the link, you can download it for all the technical details at the end, so I'll, bro I'll sort of you know, sc scoot over uh, the, the technical stuff, but if, let's imagine we've got a, a survey and we're going to try and measure the proportion of smokers in the population, um, and we've got, at first call, 24% uh, 
um, of, the, of the responding sample after one call, say they're smokers, okay? And after n calls, or let, let's, let's actually, this is for the final sample after we've done all the calls, that proportion is 18%, okay? So we say that the absolute difference from after one call, if we think of this as, we could think of this as bias, it's not really bias because we don't know the true value, but if we think that the final estimate from the survey is as good an estimate of this quantity that we're going to get, um, then the, the, the difference is 6%. We can take a relative uh, version of that, so it's 33% um, above the, the true value. We're only going to be in this uh, uh, presentation looking at the, the absolute difference because we think it's got a, a more intuitive uh, metric. It has some limitations. Um, so, but the idea, we do that for one variable, but we, don't do that, we, we do it across lots of surveys and hundreds of variables. And we see what, we, what gain do we get by doing more and more calls compared to having the final data set. So that's the, it's a quite simple rationale. Um, we do it on these surveys. Uh, so we've got six surveys. Uh, they're all sort of quite similar designs in many ways. There are some differences between them, not least in the response rates. Um, but they, and they have, they've got some um, incentives and so on, different sample sizes, slight, some differences in the, uh, the population, it's Great Britain or England. But, but broadly the same. Sorry, we've got two of these things at the RSS. You're always a bit confusing about which one I'm pressing. Um, but those are the surveys that, we, that we're using. Um, here are the response rates per, as, as we go across calls. Um, so uh, you can see, unsurprisingly, as we make more calls, the response rate gets higher. Um, that, that, the pattern is basically the same for, for each survey, but uh, some surveys, British Crime Survey, has a higher response rate uh, particularly towards the end. Um, and the, uh, the Skills for Life survey has a lower <coughs> response rate, uh, apart from right at the end where it catches up with the British election study. So that's what we look at. Um, and we take all of the non-demographic variables. We don't, we don't use demographic variables because we're going to compare weighted and unweighted estimates. Um, for, for that gives us 500 and nearly 560 questions. Uh, we transform these into binary variables. Um, and where we've got multi-COVID variables, we take uh, K minus one, um, the number of categories minus one, and have a reference category. That gives us 1,250 uh, effect sizes at each call. Um, and we code the questions in terms of whether they are uh, categorical, ordinary, ordinal, binary, multi-coded, and also what type of question they are. Are they a behavioral, attitudinal, or a belief question? Um, and then we put them all into a great big model, a multi-level meta-analysis, which has some uh, benefits that I don't have time to talk about now, but we can uh, take some questions on that. So what do the results show? I'm not going to put up the big tables, the big tables are in the, in the paper. What I'm going to show you is the, the fitted <coughs> values from the model. Okay? These are residuals. Um, so can you see that? It's a bit, um, bit, bit small. Maybe I should have made it larger, but you, you'll get the point. Okay, so. Um, each, each one of these black dots is uh, one of these different scores from the model, a, a, a model estimated difference. So this black line here is zero. Okay, so th this one, these, these are all sort of slightly below and then coming above one percentage point difference. Okay, um, something that isn't showing up there. This isn't the version that. So anyway, I, I can remember the numbers. I think. Um, so the when they when the error bars cross zero, it shows you that they're not significantly different after first call. So about half of these variables, about three hundred of the variables, aren't significantly different at first call than they are after all the calls. And the average here of all these variables is one point six percentage points. Okay, so after one call you're only, on average, 1.6 percentage points off what you get um, after all calls. There are some, there's some variability in that, of course, some of these are much uh, higher. After two calls, things flatten out a bit. Uh, can you remember the numbers here? I did put the numbers up on this on these slides. I think it's, at this point it goes from 1.6 down to one percentage point. So after, after two calls, um, and these are not post-stratified, by the way. This is just the design-weighted estimates. So after two calls, on average, over 600 variables, you're only one percentage point away from what you would get after all calls. 
after three calls it goes down to 0.7% and you can see it flattens out even more and then after five calls there's hardly any difference at all okay so certainly you know in terms of saying is it worth carrying on after five calls uh, that is I think 0.4% 0.4% after five calls is the average difference and there's not a huge amount of variability there now the other thing we can do here is to uh, post stratify these estimates um, and that's what we've done here so this is this is the same estimate just design weighted uh, and post stratified and you can see it does flatten that distribution out a bit and it brings it down from 1.6 percentage points to 1.4 okay so it does it reduces the difference a little bit and flattens out the distribution and that's the same we're making the same comparison design weighted post stratified there's that the, the mean is a bit different there and, the, and it's a bit flatter distribution and we see the same thing after three calls and after five calls post, post stratified it's essentially completely flat okay so we, we with a bit of post stratification you don't really gain anything uh, after five calls um, we, we in, as part of this model what we're able to do is, is look at differences by we can put in you know eff fixed effects and so on of, of the characteristics of the surveys and the questions uh, so there is some difference between surveys so taking part has a, a higher um, average than, than the British Crime Survey. Um, and we think that's probably to do not with the surveys themselves, but with the topic coverage and where we, we could extend this approach, have more and more surveys, and then code uh, the questions uh, and the topics of the questions. And we think that would probably account for this kind of, that, that, that's what's driving this kind of effect. There's some evidence of uh, differences in kinds of questions at one call but that's pretty much disappeared by uh, two or three calls um, and if we do these using uh, the relative absolute difference we get kind of you know pretty much the same pattern slightly different so obviously because we're using a relative measure but the, the general take home is the same so what do we take from this well we think that this this is well one thing is there's more evidence of a weak correlation between response rate and non-response bias um, it's not bias, we emphasise that, but it's as, it's as close as we're going to get. Um, so that's a weakness of this approach, but a strength compared to the Groves et al. and other studies is we're looking across um, uh, all kinds of variables that you tend to measure in normal surveys, not just these kind of niche ones that are, are health surveys. Uh, and also, we don't have any mode differences. In the Groves et al. study and other studies, they're usually comparing a self-completion survey with some admin data we're comparing face-to-face -face CAPI uh, surveys uh, across the board. Um, what do we make of this other than that, other than, well, maybe there's a weak, weak correlate, more evidence of weak correlation? Well, you could speculate that we should stop making calls after, well, maybe after one call, not doing too badly, um, uh, and ma make only one call. But it, of course, not that simple because we would have a very low sample size after one call. So you'd have to issue more sample in the first place and it would uh, create strange incentives for interviewers and so on. But I've run out of time, so we'll have to return to that in the discussion. Thanks very much. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the paper, by the way. And that's the, um, if you go to NCRM ePrints, um, you can download it from there. So um, if I was hoping maybe to have most of the questions in the discussion. I think that's probably going to be best. But maybe if there's any kind of points of clarification that people yeah. might have. Just sorry, Carl. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, with the Groves chart, chart four, whatever it was called, it was actually no response rates, no response rates. So it was a sort of reverse finding of what you could expect. Uh, well, I mean, yes, but uh, I think no. The, the response rate. Um,
Thank you very much. Um, so basically, I would like to present some work um, that is jointly done with uh, Jamie Moore, Solange Correa, and um, Peter Smith um, from the University of Southampton as well. So um, I would like to look at the assessment of the risk of non-response bias. So obviously, um, Patrick has already given a very good introduction uh, to my talk, in fact. So I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Um, the project itself uh, was actually funded under an ESRC project and work um, in this area continues under the um, NCRM uh, project, uh, the uh, first um, work uh, package um, one um, on data um, collection for data quality. So we, um, we've got a website under the NCRM uh, website so you can uh, look for outputs there and in fact two of these um, um, working papers that are related to the talk that I'm giving today um, can also be downloaded from that website, so the NCM website under research. Um, so as Patrick already indicated clearly that the uh, focus has shifted from purely looking at the res non-response rate but uh, to also now look at the uh, non-response bias. So here are some key questions about how to monitor, how to assess um, the sort of risk of non-response bias. We quite often cannot actually measure the, the true non-response bias, but at least some kind of indication of the risk of non-response bias or something that is quite closely related to the non-response bias. Uh, we can do this post or during data collection, uh, and there's a lot of um, information in the literature about how to do that once uh, data collection has been completed. But here, I'm actually doing this during data collection. So what actually happens during uh, the data collection process? And uh, related questions that are also really relevant for, for survey practice are questions like, uh, when do I stop calling? How many calls do I really need to make? Which is already something that uh, Patrick has already touched on. Or likewise, if you don't want to stop calling, who do you want to actually follow up in terms of sort of case prioritization? So these are sort of uh, related questions with regards to actually uh, the survey practice point. Um, for my work, I uh, generally need, and, and also here, uh, fully observed information on both the respondents and non-respondents, and that's obviously a little bit tricky to get uh, in most cases. Um, I've got, for example, sample frame information from, let's say, register data or census data. Here in this case, um, I will look at uh, linked census data. Um, you could also look, uh, use um, administrative data, potentially, um, or for example, in a longitudinal survey, you could lose, uh, use um, the uh, information that you have received on previous waves. So both census and previous wave information is something 
I'm going to mention here in this talk, so sensors and, and previous wave information. And the data sets I'm looking at here are both face-to-face uh, -face surveys, are all face-to-face -face surveys. Uh, it's the um, ONS sensors non-response link study. And I'll come to that in a second to explain uh, what I mean by that. And also understanding society. Um, so how do I want to assess the uh, risk of non-response bias? So the, the main idea is here basically to look at the um, response um, propensity variability. So that we would like to have a, some sort of measure between the similarity between the sample data um, and the data that uh, is subject um, to response. So we're looking at the variation of response rate or the variation of response propensity. So basically, I would need to fit a model that's quite common in the non-response literature to, to model the non-response process, and the predicted response propensities can be used as some sort of indicator or the variability uh, in these response propensities can be used as an indicator of the risk of non-response bias. Um, so basically, this is exactly the idea of these representativeness indicators and how they're defined. I'll come to that uh, on, the, on the next slide. So basically, we estimate the variation of these response propensities, and what I call the ST is the standard deviation of these response propensities. And the idea is that um, low variability in these response propensities would then imply a high representativeness. So that's a sort of key idea behind that. So we would like to have low variability to indicate high representativeness, and then hopefully that would then indicate low non-response bias. Um, so basically, there are two uh, indicators that I'm going to look at here in this presentation. In fact, there are, there are many more one could uh, investigate, but here I'll, I'll pick out two. One is the um, R indicator developed by um, Barry Schouten and, and, and the team, um, Natalie Schlomo, uh, Christina, and others um, uh, as part of a risk project. Um, so basically, that just measures the variability of these uh, response propensities. Um, and basically, it's an indicator, and uh, basically it means if it's close to one, then it indicates high representativeness. So close to one indicators would be um, uh, advantageous. Um, the um, other one would be the coefficient of variation, the CV. And basically, it's uh, based on the similar sort of idea, also measuring the response propensity variability, but this time dividing actually by the response rate, so by ba basically standardizing by the response rate. So I'm trying to take the response rate into account that has a certain advantage. And I'll come to that um, in just a second. And uh, commonly in the literature, those types of indicators have been computed at the end of data collection or to compare different types of surveys as an alternative to the non-response rate. Um, but here I'm actually computing, computing it during data collection, basically computing it at every call, which also then means that um, I need to uh, basically fit a response propensity model at every call. So um, there's a little bit of work uh, involved as well. And by call, when I talk about calls, because I've got face-to-face -face service here, uh, I basically mean visits to, to a household by an interviewer. Uh, and this work obviously could also be extended to telephone surveys. I've not done this here, but, but this certainly would be possible may even be possible to uh, extend this type of work to, to web service where you look at the um, time it takes to, for people to respond or, and time of, of data collection. So just to sort of summarize the key research questions, I would like to sort of visualize, first of all, these trends in representativeness indicating a non-response bias. Uh, then the question is, um, I've got uh, several surveys and I would like to see if uh, certain trends can be generalized, are there sort of general trends that I can um, identify? Um, and also, can I um, derive sort of stopping points? Do I have, in terms of survey practice uh, perspective, some indication about when, when could I stop calling, when is it enough? Very similar to basically the research question by, by Patrick. Um, briefly describing uh, the data that I've got, uh, it's first of all the uh, ONS 2011 Census Non-Response Link Study. Uh, so here we were um, able, or bas basically the ONS did that uh, work actually for us, the matching. Um, we had the response outcome from three surveys. In fact, these were the labor force survey, the life opportunity survey, and the opinion survey. Um, and we were able to link this to the core record data from these surveys, so that's okay. And then to census uh, data from the UK as well in 2011. So timing-wise, these were roughly uh, um, sampled at the same time or observed at the same time. And we've got in total about 20 calls to a household uh, in, in these types of surveys. 
Um, and the information here uh, only includes um, household level census variables that are basically fully observed, based, uh, basically available on both the respondents and the non-respondents to the survey. Um, nowadays, we also have the individual level census variables and we are still waiting for the actual survey variables to be linked, or at least some of them. So we are still waiting for some of the data uh, to be given to us. Um, just have a look at some, some of the results. Um, we first fitted the, the R indicator, or first of all, basically replicating um, the sort of plots that uh, Patrick showed. So basically, across calls, we can see obviously that the response rate across these three different surveys, the labor force survey, the uh, life opportunity surveys, and the opinion surveys uh, go up, um, as you would expect. So that's, that's a good sign, I suppose. The more calls you're making, the, more, the higher the, the response rate goes, and then it sort of levels off, at least uh, uh, on this graph here. Obviously, in, in reality, it still uh, increases uh, slightly. And then look at the R indicator, we can actually see that, so basically, just to remind ourselves, uh, an R indicator of close to one would be a very high representativeness. So we basically see that at the very first call, we are getting strangely a very high representativeness indicator. So the response rate at the very first call is very low, it's about 10%. So basically, the R indicator here indicates it's not really picking up on, on the right thing. It's sort of measuring uh, low variability um, but it's not taking into account the, the low response rate. So it's giving me a, a false um, uh, results, basically. Um, hang on, next slide. Um, so basically indicating, uh, yeah, basically misleading uh, a high representativeness. And then actually it goes down, so indicating something uh, quite relatively bad is happening, and then it sort of uh, indicates uh, an increase again. But again, uh, it's not really uh, easily interpretable, which is then why we thought about looking at the CV, the coefficient of variation, which does take into account the, the response rate, in particular, obviously, the low response rate. So that's exactly the same graph, again, showing the response rates that are going up but now plotting the CV. So at the very beginning, the CVs are uh, relatively high, indicating uh, low representativeness. So it's not something we would like. And obviously then the more calls we are making, uh, we are seeing what we would expect, that the uh, representativeness goes, uh, I goes up, i.e. The, the CV goes, goes down. So basically, the more calls we are making, the better the representativeness. So we are doing better with regards to the risk of non-response bias, i.e. reducing that risk. We basically see some sort of leveling out about after six, seven calls, um, we, we sort of see a, a leveling out. So there is no improvement really anymore uh, in terms of the CV. <coughs> um, also, to develop these sort of indicators further, I've just uh, showed some results on the sort of um, overall indicators, but one could actually drill down and look at certain categories or certain variables. So for example, if you're particularly interested in, in subgroups, in particular differences of uh, uh, of subgroups, for example, the unemployed, then one can also have a look at these partial um, CVs. They are conditional and unconditional va variations, actually. Um, and they are basically estimating the extent to which the response is representative with regards to certain covariates or certain uh, categories of covariates. And here we found uh, quite a lot of similarities between these different surveys. And um, for some variables, we can see really an improvement across calls. So they start quite badly, but the more calls we are making, the better we are doing. But we've also found the case that um, the more calls we are making, there is almost no improvement whatsoever. We are starting not badly, but there is no improvement. So making more and more calls, we are not actually changing the composition of the, of the, of the, of the survey. So we are not, with regards to the, those particular variables, not improving anything. I'm now not showing any of these results. They are, they are all in the papers, and um, I can uh, give you the, those types of, of things as well. Um, sort of developing this, these ideas further and trying to use um, those indicators and findings in survey practice, we asked ourselves, when would it make sense to stop calling, or when um, do we maybe change our data strategy or data collection strategy? So that just the fact that we are seeing, we are making all these calls, but actually nothing is improving or nothing is changing, you may either say, well, now we could stop calling, or you may think, well, now we would need to change our data strategy collection. Maybe you offer now incentives or you send different types of interviews potentially, or maybe you're going after certain types of cases in particular because you're, make, you're realizing you're not really changing anything. So just continuing with your, your current data collection procedure, um, you could argue you are just sort of losing money, but maybe not improving the actual data quality. So there's a, is a, is a maybe a, a case to sort of look into that a little bit more in detail. Um, so basically the idea is then to, the other gadget, um, to look at these CVs and to sort of see when they are flattening out. And this flattening out one could define as how does it compare to the final estimate? So basically when does this flattening out 
does it not uh, really um, depend anymore, or does not differ anymore very much to the final estimate. So adaptive strategy to stop when the indicator is within a certain range of the, the minimum value. Um, or the responsive strategy is stop when the indicator is within a certain threshold of the previous value. So we are basically comparing two consecutive values. So when does this flattening out happen? And just looking at the sort of results from the overall um, representativeness indicators, we basically found across these three different surveys, um, yes, they, they vary, but um, they don't seem to be varying um, tremendously. So overall we found um, face capacity points, so an adaptive strategy um, between six and eight calls, or a responsive uh, um, strategy, so very similarly defined, between uh, five and seven calls. And uh, we were interested in just a, a purely average um, estimate how many um, calls we could potentially save if we stopped really um, at this time, rather than maybe continuing with, with, with a different uh, collection strategy. We could save between eight uh, and 18% of calls. And obviously, um, um, this doesn't really reflect costs. We, in fact, asked for some uh, cost data, so we can just sort of yeah, put down some average costs. We don't really have any information about the, the true cost of these data collection methods. But obviously, if, you if the argument is that um, towards the end, um, harder to reach uh, respondents are obviously even more costly than uh, these sort of um, 8 to 15, 18 percent of calls that you could save could result in quite a lot of um, cost savings potentially. And rather than just looking at this from an overall perspective, these um, coefficients of variation, one can look at uh, stopping points also by certain types of variables or certain types of categories. And overall, we didn't find anything that was indicating calls above eight was uh, of, an, of any um, use effectively, so anything that was the sort of maximum number, so um, one could even argue to stay uh, below that. Just to sort of provide a little bit further evidence from another survey, the um, Understanding Society survey, that's a longitudinal survey, and here we um, analyzed something quite similarly, and we've used um, the previous wave information as sort of fully observed information, basically uh, giving us some information about respondents and non-respondents. And here we've used a slightly different approach. First of all, the so-called uh, dissimilarity indices. The idea is that we are comparing um, two distributions, one for the respondents only, and ideally we would like to have the full sample. So how does it compare to the distribution of the full sample? So we are trying to compare both of these distributions. Um, and in fact, we've also used our indicator and, oops, sorry, wrong gadget, um, our indicator and uh, the coefficient of variation just as a, as a matter of comparison. So we've used the different types of indicator and we, we have a look um, if we find um, sort of similar results or different results. Just very briefly, the delta index basically compares um, the um, observed proportion of a particular variable in a particular category with um, the expected proportion of this uh, particular variable and category by um, expected, I would mean, from the very full sample um, and the observed would be based on the, non uh, on the respondents only. So the advantage here is that actually no model is required, so I don't need to fit a model at every call. And again, this indicator ranges between zero to one. Mm -hmm. um, let's briefly look at some of these results. So you can fit these uh, dissimilarity in this for all sorts of uh, different types of, cut, uh, of, of variables, not just categorical variables, um, for example, then you would look at slightly different dissimilarity indices. But here, I've just looked at binary and categorical variables, and we can see that um, again, the same sort of trend I is visible, that at the very beginning um, we've got a high um, indication of non-representativeness, of indication of risk of non-response bias, and then it sort of goes down. Different types of uh, variables give slightly different patterns, but overall we can see that with an increasing number of calls um, it goes down to zero, or at least um, it levels out and gives uh, a smaller indication of bias. Um, comparing this to the CV, um, so basically the CV in this data set is also giving us the same sort of trend as, as previously, again indicating after about five, six calls there is some sort of leveling out, um, again indicating the, the R indica indicator here at the top doing slightly, um, um, slightly strange behavior and uh, sort of leading to possibly misleading results, so again not, not um, um, recommended. So just to sort of summarize, um, so basically, 
Um, representativeness increases similarly in the different surveys um, that uh, we've looked at. So we came with different types of surveys that we um, analyzed to very, very uh, similar um, results. Um, Sources of non-representativeness were, for example, um, single adults or people living in, how in, in London and so on. It depends, obviously, my analysis on the types of variables that I've got available. For the census, there are obviously only a limited number of variables that I've got available, clearly. Um, overall, we found that the CV is clearly preferable to the um, R indicator in this context, measuring the risk of non-response bias during um, uh, data collection, because it doesn't take into account um, the um, actual response rate. Um, data collection points that differ across these different surveys, but uh, only slightly, and overall we didn't find anything that would be indicating calls above eight calls um, to, making, to be making any, any difference, really. Um, in terms of the dissimilarity index, that certainly um, had a number of advantages. Um, you didn't need to find, or you didn't need to fit a response propensity uh, model at every call, so that's uh, quite attractive. It's quite a simple indicator to calculate. Um, you can monitor categorical variables also with different types of categories across uh, calls. Um, yes, it sort of uh, gives quite nice sort of trends and um, visual um, graphs that you could uh, follow. And yeah, overall we found that the um, results for the coefficient of variation, one indicator of representativeness, are very, very similar to the dissimilarity index. They're different uh, indicators, although they are um, related as well, depending on the types of assumptions um, you're making. So that was quite reassuring to see for different surveys and for different indicators, um, very similar trends. And yeah, the implications for survey practice, just to sort of bring it to a conclusion, um, that based on the analysis that I've done here, or that we've done here in Southampton, that the number of calls um, could be reduced, so no more than, than eight calls we found, and there could be some implications for cost savings potentially. I mean, obviously it would be really nice to, to repeat this type of um, analysis on, on different surveys and also with different types of um, auxiliary variables. Also, we would like to take into account the actual um, survey um, outcomes and see how that compares, but we don't really have that uh, information yet, so there's still some more work that uh, can be done. So thank you very much. Okay, same again. So if there's any points of clarification or a couple of quick questions now, uh, and then there'll be more opportunity for very further discussion. Yes, um, we have in fact at the very beginning before we started with that we did quite a lot of analysis using 
example, time um, of the survey or week of the survey, and, and also in the literature you find um, others using sometimes time or week, and I'm doing some analysis with um, Statistics Sweden as well, so there at the very beginning we also used uh, time and week of the data collection process. Um, you're getting very similar graphs, now maybe the conclusions are slightly different because obviously now you're looking at, at time and so on, but the principle in terms of the methodology would be very, very similar. Here I've presented uh, the number of goals, but obviously clearly from a survey practice perspective you may want to look at time, if you're particularly if you're having time data coming in um, regularly, uh, because obviously the number of goals, maybe one call that is made for one household is the first call, but for some other household it's already the 20th call. So obviously from a data management perspective maybe you can only measure time, particularly if you're doing it, doing a real time uh, progression. So very clearly. Then you, your other point that you've made is, is a very, very uh, important point, and I'm very much aware of that, that obviously sometimes you can do visits and they are already related to another visit, so the actual real cost for that is maybe potentially quite small. Um, so yes, we cannot uh, judge that with our data that we've got because we don't have any information about um, the location of each individual um, household or, or if there were some synergy effects. So unfortunately we personally cannot do that analysis, but obviously clearly that is very important. So ONS almost certainly will have much better data on that and, and could do that uh, analysis. So that's really, really nice, yes. Totally agree. going to talk about today is uh, just a kind of extension, but a very much a simpler extension of what of the work that Pat uh, and Ian have done, um, specifically looking at what is the impact of fieldwork effort on subpopulation estimates, and so not the total population estimates that we've, we've largely looked at so far. Now, Pat and Ian used multiple survey sources to derive a, a more or less a general model of the impact of fieldwork effort, and as, you, as you've seen, they found pretty modest effects. The modest effects on total population estimates may hide much larger effects on subpopulation estimates. Um, although subpopulations will often be more homogeneous than the total population with respect to target variables, but that doesn't mean that the impact of fieldwork effort is necessarily uh, smaller. Uh, for instance, the, there may be a correlation between the response propensity and the measured characteristics might be greater for the subpopulation for the total population, there might be a bit more variance in the response propensity itself within that group, uh, and then the response rate itself could be lower, which has a, uh, a direct imp impact on bias. Now, it's usually uh, very difficult to estimate the impact of fieldwork effort on subpopulation estimates because um, they, by their nature, have smaller sample sizes, so the systematic effects tend to be uh, confounded with a fair bit of random sampling error. Um, now the exception, the work I'm doing here is, is based on the crime survey of England and Wales, which is an ONS study that TNS, BMRB does the field work for, and it's very much an exception in that we do 35,000 interviews per year, and that is large enough to separate out uh, the effect for plenty of subpopulations. So for this particular work, for instance, uh, for most of the variables in this study, we've got sufficient power to detect well this kind of relative changes that Pat was talking about. And we can certainly detect most if it's 10% or greater, it's largely going to be detected for all the subgroups that all the subpopulations I look at. And in most cases, much smaller changes would trigger a positive uh, significance test. So we have a pretty good pretty good power for this study. Um, although, of course, although we have all that power. It's to, to make conclusive judgments for this survey, uh, findings may not be as generalizable because there may be a case of uh, you know, topic specificity. So this was uh, based on a project for ONS that we did uh, late last year. Uh, there was a, a fall in the response rate from 74% um, to around 70% in a single year. Uh, um, although there has been some general decline in response rates, the crime survey had actually kept pretty steady at around 75% for about a, a decade and a half with one or two dips. So this was quite significant for them, although 70% is still very high for a, a UK general population survey. Uh, but anyway, ONS asked us to explore the impact of a lower response rate on the headline statistics that they publish. So what we did was use data from the 2012 to 14 period where the response rate was 74% and when then we stripped off the interviews obtained uh, after reissuing initially unproductive cases. 
is that generally speaking, what you'll do is issue out the assignments initially, the interviewers will do their best, and then we'll repackage some of the unproductive cases to do reissue uh, assignments later on. Um, and that raised the response rate from 66% to 74% over this period. So it added about eight percentage points to the response rate. Um, now, 66 is clearly lower than 70, so our hope was that by looking at the difference between the uh, estimate after the original issue of assignments versus the final estimate, that would at least give us an outside edge of the impact of this uh, lower response rate. Now, of course, putting in less field work effort is not the same as putting in the same amount of effort, but obtaining uh, uh, a lower response rate. But I think it's plausible to think that the sample itself may be ranked by the sort of unobserved response propensity and then you know either less effort or equal effort but less success would achieve more or less the same sort of sample at least approximately equal so it seems reasonable to us to use this data to work out the impact of this lower response rate now the focus was on the impact of reissues uh, for the reasons of convenience but reissues are also a disproportionately costly element of field work with very high per interview pay rates. The pay rate changes quite a lot in that, that phase. Reasonably interesting to actually look at uh, the number of visits made per address crossed with the position of the interview in the sequence. So the very first interview, on average, it's taken 1.3 visits to obtain that first interview. And generally speaking, it goes up by about a quarter of a visit for every uh, subsequent interview. On average, each of these interviews uh, achieved at the original assignment took about three and a half visits to obtain. But as you can see, it's much higher at the far end where we're getting into the sort of six visits, seven visits sort of area, sort of the point where Gabby was suggesting a stopping point is concerned. Now, the pay per interview is geared quite strongly. So the early ones are paid far, far less than the late ones in order to encourage interviewers to keep going because they make trips to areas where a lot of the easy, the low-hanging fruit is already gone. We need some sort of motivation for them uh, to keep going back. And those trips are relatively inefficient uh, for us because we're paying quite a lot in terms of expenses, let alone the uh, interview pay. So reissues, though, are a different order of uh, expense. So, as I say, after the original issue stage, response rate is... 66%, each interview took on average 3.4 visits to achieve. Now the average per issued address is slightly higher than that because ultimately unproductive addresses are visited more than productive ones on the whole. Uh, they're, they're on average visited 5.5 times. But after the, all the reissue stages, and there's not one, there's actually up to four reissue stages uh, in the crime survey, and the response rate goes up, as I say, by eight percentage points, but each interviewer interview takes on average another 12 visits on top of the visits that they did in the original assignment. So the original assignment, the average interview is 3.4 visits it took to get. Uh, for these reissue cases, it's 18 visits. Um, and although the pay that's given out is not linearly related to the number of visits, it's not very far off that, so it's extremely expensive. And overall, f about 45% of all visits are made at this reissue stage just to raise that response rate by eight percentage points. So this high pay for reissue interviews, I think is pretty much the norm as survey agencies seek to hit contractual response rate targets. Uh, and the obviously the cost is then passed on to clients and you know, ultimately the taxpayer. So there the additional value of this additional work needs to be uh, fairly obvious. So ONS asked us to uh, well, they identified three variables defining subpopulations that they wanted to track, so they didn't just want to look at it on the overall basis. And they were selected because of the apparent variability in the response rates between each subpopulation. Now, obviously, other subpopulations could have been selected, but the ones we selected here were age group, um, ACORN categories. This is a, a uh, postcode segmentation based on multiple sources by the uh, company CACI, and this is very much the simplest version of it, which only has five categories, uh, and housing tenure as well. Um, now for two of these variables, for age group and ACORN group, you can actually calculate formal response rates, uh, showing the progress over different 
uh, fieldwork stages. So, for example, if we look at acorn group, uh, we can see this is the in the red uh, percentage is the position we're at after the original issue assignments have been completed. And you can see there's a fair amount of uh, variability between types of area, where areas described as rising prosperity and urban adversity are uh, considerably lower levels than the affluent achievers uh, types of areas. There's a very long document describing all of these, these types of areas. And then the little orange bit is showing you how much extra we manage um, after the reissues. And the standard deviation uh, between these groups in terms of response rate does reduce, um, so the reissuing does even things up in the way that you would quite like. Um, and obviously the response rates increase, so the risk of bias is slightly reduced as well. So that sort of works as expected. Age group is a little bit slightly different from that. And you see that there's quite a lot more var variation in response rate by age group, where we're barely over 50% for those aged 16 to 24 after the first round, but we're getting up to 80% amongst the 65 to 74. So there's actually quite a lot of variation. And the reissuing doesn't do very much to reduce that either. Um, it, given that most of the reissuing is effectively to hit a contractual target, is not as strategic as you might think. Um, so effectively, there isn't a great deal of, of reduction in variation there. Now, ONS wanted to look at all their key published estimates, and there was a, essentially a mixture of uh, prevalence or incidence of crimes, behaviours, and uh, reported attitudes. And in total, there are 37 variables, so a lot smaller than than the study we've done with with Pat. Five metric, a few, most of the rest of them categorical variables. Um, it's certainly by no means a random selection of the variables that are found within the crime survey, but they cover most of the modules where all the respondents are asked something. It's very difficult to identify impacts on subpopulations from modules where only one fifth of the sample has, has got it. So we have some restrictions there. Um, now, the estimates that we've taken after original issue and after reissues have both been post-stratified because that's exactly what ONS would do with that data. So we try to mimic what they would do if they had lower uh, response rate data. And I've, I've, we estimated the actual differences as Pat's paper showed, but we also, because the, the subpopulations have, have different sample sizes and of course the variables themselves are measured in different ways, we've also standardized these differences into uh, T-scores, so we can better summarise across groups. Um, so let's have a look, at, just look at the absolute differences first, which I think basically gives the game away here. So this was just as an example crossed by age group and across all the uh, categorical variables. The, the percentage figure in the red shows a percentage of these 30... 30 odd variables where the difference made by reissuing was less than 0.1 percentage point, uh, which was certainly the modal uh, category here. And there's a very small number where the, uh, the difference made was um, 0.5 percentage points. Now, of course, some of these estimates are actually quite close to the zero points, so 0.5 percentage points would, would be um, substantial. But most of them are around the midpoint, and you wouldn't call this, while these are statistically significant differences, you probably wouldn't call them you know, truly significant differences, if you, if you know what I mean. So that's just an indication that effectively we were finding for the age group population, the different age groups, more or less what Pat found for the total population. Um, I thought it was interesting with the T-scores, just as a way of, of summarising this, was to actually plot the T-scores in ascending order, and then plot it against what you might expect if there was absolutely no systematic difference whatsoever made by all that reassuring. Um, so the, the, the line in dots is effectively the T-distribution, the null distribution, if you like, um, which I checked to see if it would work with these 77 variables by just dividing the sample randomly into two and looking at the, the range of, looking at the distribution there, and it does fit that. Um, so you can see in the total estimate, the average T-score was 1.15, and if there was no impact at all, you'd expect that to be around uh, 0.8. So the difference all that reissuing made is something like a third of a very tiny standard error, if you like. Um, but the key question here, of course, was does this follow for all of the other subpopulations? 
Um, so this is uh, age groups, um, and I think the, the answer to that is yes. Um, and it does say something that, you know, as we expected, these, these subpopulations are more homogeneous than the total population, and their scores are closer to that null expectation than the total population estimates as well. Uh, in fact, the group that were of greatest concern to ONS, which was 16 to 24-year-olds, there seems to be absolutely no impact whatsoever from all that uh, reassuring, although their response rate relatively increases by, any other, by more than any other group. Um, possibly not worth showing all the other charts because basically this, the story uh, is the same for all the different groups we have. So it just didn't vary from that. You can see some right at the far end which were reasonably big um, T-scores, but as Pat found, what, some of those were quite clearly related to the amount of effort you put in um, to obtain, the, uh, to obtain it. But also that um, you, you were unable to calculate what, the, what the, the very final one should be from the null distribution. So it's probably uh, quite reasonable that it, those go off the end like that. So which variables, given that hardly any change is observed at all, I mean, are there any variables that exhibit some? I, I mean, obviously there are no large differences, um, certainly not on the topics of trust in the police or personal experience of crime, and actually personal experience of crime is the whole point of the crime survey, so there's no, nothing going on there at all. The impact is strongest around the topic of perception of local conditions, like is there a lot of graffiti in the area or vandalism or that sort of thing. Um, plus also the personal use of cannabis, which counterintuitively, I think to me, appeared to be too high based on the original issued sample and then was reduced by the, by the reissues. But the direction of impact of some of these things is quite mixed, so you, couldn't, you weren't really seeing a theme uh, particularly. And that indicates, uh, so in some cases the lower response rates seem to understate lower local concerns and sometimes they seem to overstate it relative to the to the final estimate. And I think a sort of lack of systematic pattern suggests that random sampling error might be uh, responsible for most of these larger differences. And when I say the large differences, I'm still talking about extremely tiny differences and nothing that you, know, you would notice. So in conclusion, uh, we're obviously seeing very limited impact of all that extra fieldwork effort, and so that you know, supports Pat and Ian's model. And it appears to be true of subpopulations assessed for this study, at least, and for this survey. And it's unclear, you know, how transportable those findings are, um, or how generalizable. Uh, but I suspect they're unlikely to be unique, and that if you perform this analysis across a lot of different surveys, you'd, you'd find something very similar. Uh, now, the original assignment versus reissue assignment demarcation is actually a critical one for survey agencies because they pay so much more for the interviews from the reissue assignments. Um, now, the cost of reissuing is at least 20% of the total cost, 45% or so of all the visits that are made, and it's all to get 10% of the interviews with very little actual difference in any of the estimates as far as we can tell. So it's, it's quite hard to argue for reissuing here on statistical grounds. Uh, I mean, but research commissioners like high response rates because they provide kind of public credibility, I guess, and it, that's an intangible that is worth quite a lot to them. So they shouldn't be dismissed on that basis. Um, however, I would still say that targeting specific response rates uh, tends to large surveys with cost, um, and it puts them out of reach, in fact, of many research buyers, as Pat showed some of the prices there. I thought 250 pounds, incidentally, seemed very high. <laughs> But um, you know, in the, in the order of 150 at least for that for the survey you were describing, and I wonder if you know a less uh, macho approach to field work might ultimately protect the random sample method, which I certainly believe in, and should be promoted by statisticians and the industry at large a bit more a bit more than it is. Um, Summit on and half business innovation skills. Any work being done, any big plan, are you doing something similar looking at business surveys? The typical one that you know, about the issue of retail time service to businesses. So, you know, these efforts to call back up these expenses are built for face to face stuff. 
Uh, they like to be in big frequencies because I've just asked two calls and they move on. Um, we often find that our telephone power data is not quite what we'd like it to be. Um, so although we, we did a very large English business survey a couple of years ago, um, power data was not, it was, it was hard, to, hard to follow, I think the thing is. Whereas there's been a lot more development in terms of the quality of power data around face-to-face -face surveys. There's an awful, awful lot of rubbish still with telephone surveys. But in principle, there'll be no reason why we couldn't do that. But you're much more likely to get the power data now than back in 2010 or 11. Um, Michael Baxter, Cantel Media. I'd like to defend uh, red and digit dialing. Uh, I had experience with uh, doing surveys in the United Arab Emirates, which is an absolute nightmare. Because, um, the overwhelming majority of the population are guest workers. The proportion of natives is something like 14 to 17% of the population. So there's no question of trying to keep things from the electoral register. Uh, <coughs> trying to form lists of addresses is extremely dodgy because huge numbers of these people live in uh, labour camps. So um, we found that the uh, rate of penetration of um, mobile phones is something like 120%. Uh, most people, actually everybody's got one, lots of people have two. And um, we're part of the same group as TNS actually, so um, we've got TNS to do a, a random digit sterling survey, and we've got a response rate of something like 50%. So uh, there is no other way to do it in a country like that because anybody else has got any bright ideas. I don't think any of us were attacking random digit dialing. <laughs> we just don't do it very much in this country, I think. Chris? Yeah, um, Chris Kershaw from Home Office. Very interesting presentations, making kind of quite compelling cases. I do wonder, though, if you're looking at... Uh, uh, sort of pulling apart results from surveys that have taken place and looking at different points in time, whether you know, you're partly missing a bit of the point because aren't there going to be psychological effects on the interviewers and on the managers of the survey organisation if you alter the incentives around you know, having to get a high response rate? You know, I mean, took it to the extreme, you could have a very different kind of behaviour for interviews. And, you know, you, you would have a different, you, it wouldn't, you wouldn't get the same results. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I think that's, yeah, that's certainly a, a good point, and I think you'd have to be very careful about sort of extrapolating from um, the, the study that I talked about, saying you know, stop after a certain number, because this is based on data that was collected with certain incentive structure for the interviewers and the agencies. You change that and that could change behaviour in un unpredictable ways. So I think mean, there, there's indications that you could save money, but you have to think about it quite carefully. Um, I, I think where um, I would see uh, the, 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 the sort of most in interesting uh, finding is, is on, on the first point about you know, what is the correlation between uh, non-response and, and the accuracy of response, which is really uh, a, an important thing. And, and just to sort of to pick up on uh, on, on Joel's point um, about you know being tied in to the kind of the, the public perception and the trust in the quality of the data and so on. I mean that is that is, of course that's a, that's a, a, a you know, have to take into consideration. But it, it's a bit of a sort of you know. Uh, a straitjacket that we perhaps need to sort of break out of, um, and, and it's hard to, to, to see how that happens. But I think we do need to, to perhaps get there. And from from my side of, uh, of things, being someone who um, is, is you know, often in a position of, of kind of judging tenders for a, for a, as many people in this room will have done, is that I think one of the reasons this is a bit of a pet theory of mine anyway. One of the reasons why we we end up in this this you know, cycle of trying to get responses is because it's an easy way of judging between different you know, organisations that are bidding for it to do a project. You can say, well, we'll get a high response rate. How will you do it? We've got this whole kind of you know, evidence base up around how to get not high response rates, and there are new innovations coming in all the time. It's much easier. Once you take out the what will you do to get the response rate up, 
it's much harder to judge between uh, companies. Uh, and so I think that's, that's part of the reason why it kind of, it, it, and then you end up with this contractual target uh, and it's seen. And so, you know, I, but I, I would like to think that, um, that this, all, all of the papers are contributing to a more recent kind of uh, trend of, of questioning the simple use of the headline response rate I mean, and, 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 and the, uh, the sorts of kind of um, strategies that we expensively deploy to try and maintain that. And that's all tied in with the, you know, the long term viability of, of uh, random surveys. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that, so I think that research buyers, if a company is able to achieve a high response rate, I think they also imagine, well, this is high quality in this area, it'll also be a high quality performance in all sorts of other areas as well, even if the connection is not explicit. I think that it's implicit and it's in the interest of agencies, for instance, to project that uh, as well. Um, in, to, to some extent, agencies know they're competing against each other. One of the obvious things in which they can differentiate is to demonstrate what they've achieved in the past and what they expect to achieve. Um, so, you know, agencies are complicit also, uh, and they never come in and say, you know what, 45% will do. There was a question just behind this. Right? Yeah, I mean, David Fry, the Department of Communities and Local Government, and in, in a sense, actually, that conversation has partly got to, to what I was thinking of, because, I mean, I've been in the position of, of selecting people, and, um, and, you know, obviously, we're taught response rate is a simple thing, and uh, to look at when you measure quality, um, and, you know, I've been there when, you know, different survey people come and say, oh, well, you currently get this percentage rate, we can do 2% better than that. And I'm thinking, well, actually, I know both of you relatively well, I don't think you're going to easily do that, but if you tell me you will do it, then I'll expect you to do it. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think that your mm. point about being complicit, I think, is there. So, trying to get that focus somewhere else. But, I mean, I think it's really interesting, and I, th I think, you know, my sort of, intellectually, to me, once you've got a good response rate, argue what is good, but a relatively high one, that difference between getting 70% or 65% and 70%, I can see maybe doesn't make a lot of difference. But would you then get, in terms of a, a rational debate about, it maybe costs the survey house a lot of money to get that, that extra bit, and maybe that money could be spent better improving other things like data quality and validation and those other things. But would it actually get done? So you know, it, it, it's trying to find something else then that would, that would work. So maybe it isn't the right thing to do, but we need something else then to focus on. And I'm not quite sure what that is. And so the final bit around that would be, you know, we talk when people look at surveys. So say working in government, we've got lots of policy people who will find the first survey that tells them the answer they want to hear, and we'll you know try and educate them on certain things they should look at. And response rates is clearly one of them. So we need to think of, of some simpler way of, of, of getting people to, to look at a, a quality that, that maybe doesn't, you know, it's not as straightforward as that. <coughs> uh, there was a, Nick's hand went up first and then I'll cut you off. Yeah, I mean, well, my chief, the you go back out of the way now. I'll make a more serious one. First, a quick question. Have you actually had time yet, or the ability yet, to look at whether you actually change the relationship within the data? I wonder that might actually happen with the extra people you get in. Um, but the, the, the point of our question is, as I'm picking up what was said earlier, it's actually really difficult to try and control costs through, through this. We really don't know what's going on uh, in terms of uh, making extra calls and this kind of thing. And the thing about adaptive design is you want to learn, it's, it's really so, every response rate is so specific. You want to learn as you go along. And the trouble is, by the time you've actually learned something, half the sampling point will have finished, the course will be halfway through, and it will start again, because that's, that's how it works. Uh, and it becomes very difficult then to do any kind of adaptive <coughs> design because you, you're starting then to have one set of rules for one set of starting points and a different set of rules for a different set of starting points and they won't be a random subset of all starting points. So you might, it seems to me that you, 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 it's realistic to say up front that we're not going to reissue or we're going to do certain things. But I think the idea of learning as you go along and say, OK, we're now going to stop the six calls on this survey is really, really difficult to do in practice. Yes, I mean, I would imagine that, I think, I think the point of the of work that Pat's done is to show that across lots of different surveys and different questions within them, 
that the effect was pretty minimal, in which case it's not unreasonable to say, let's have a general rule across all of these surveys, in which there is a, you know, a maximum of five calls are made, and there'll be some rules about when those five calls are made, but that there is some sort of limit to it, and that interviewers are not effectively <coughs> paid for um, calls beyond that, beyond that point. And you might say, well, that's a bit one size fits all. Uh, but I suppose what Pat's shown here is that one size fits all might be a reasonable strategy for this type of survey. Yeah, and I, I, well, I was going to, Joel keeps saying, Pat, you're the first author of the paper, so it was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so but on, on, the other, on the other point of associations, I mean, I think we haven't looked at that as the answer. My guess is, you know, it doesn't seem that it should be the case in theory, theory terms, but. It, it does tend to be the case that associational relationships tend to be more robust to selection effects than kind of, uh, the univariate distribution. So I'd expect that to, to be the case, but it'll be something certainly to, to look at. Um, yeah, the other thing I think that is it, it's relevant here is, is as I started off saying about we've lived, inhabited this world of uh, you know, CAPI, PATH, 3000 you know, uh, household samples for a long time, and that's probably going to change, it's already changing, um, and the sorts of surveys that we may be likely to be getting more of are things like the community life survey, you know, push to web type of things, or, or web panels that are coming off the back of uh, uh, existing cross sections like the ESS are doing at the moment, where you've actually got, if you net it all out, you've got very low response rates, but you can still recover the selection probability, you've still got a random sample which is different from the you know the, the sort of um, well the UGAF approach where you just you know you get anyone who will come along and then you, you weight them um, and there's sort of there's been a lot of speculation around saying well you know the very low response rate survey is functionally equivalent to the kind of the quota sample but I'm I'm getting way beyond the data here but I'm guessing that it isn't you know I think that this this kind of evidence pushing it a little bit further could be saying that. You know, as long as you approach a random sample of people and you get some of them to respond, you know, you're doing a lot better than getting people come to you and, <coughs> come to you and, and that sort of approach. I, mean, I think that's, there obviously needs to be a lot more research there, but I think that, that you know, we could take it in that direction. I think, um, just to add to that, I mean, just thinking about the statistic that Gabby presented of the coefficient of variation, that there is a world of difference between, say, a response rate of 10% and a response rate of 1% mm. in terms of that measure. And that measure is you know, directly related to bias. Um, and I sometimes think of online panel surveys, for instance, as a denominator being more or less the internet population of that country, in which case you're probably getting down to sort of 0.1% and lower, even for the very largest survey. So their risk of bias ought to be much greater than a survey a very low response rate random sample survey, I think. Yeah, was, yeah that was actually the point I was actually going to ask about, because you made the three interesting things about <laughs> how if you have committed yourself to conduct a random survey, random sample survey, you should then do a more cost efficient so, uh, and uh, accurate manner. But it doesn't seem to me that it directly addresses this, this question about whether the volunteer samples, access panels, or whatever you want to call them such as you and other, other companies offer. It doesn't seem to me to have any direct relevance to the accuracy of that form of, of survey. Um, my, my personal view, and I'd like to hear from how the speakers is, is that even writing something at a much lower response rate than we've been talking about today is still better than the volunteer approach because you, you start with no, almost no selection bias. So you don't have to worry about the non response problem. Whereas with volunteer panels, you do start with, I mean, nothing is random at all. That means uh, people can be, um, pretend to be representative. So, uh, how is your view? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's where I'm going. In fact, that there are some studies. Mario Caligaro sitting behind you there has, has, has done some work comparing um, and, and reviewing studies that have um, compared online panel estimates for the same variable with a usually like RDD or you know, web panels that, that, that's random, and you do get differences, you know, so, so, but then the problem is, uh, which one's right? We don't know. Um, but I guess if you follow, pursue this logic through what we've been showing today, that 
a low response rate random survey is not terribly different in the aggregate from a high uh, response rate random survey. We tend to treat high response rate random surveys as the gold standard. Then you know you can sort of extrapolate to say that the, the quota samples are generally pretty inaccurate. But you know there, there's there's quite a lot of myths and buts in there. There was one more there, and this probably will need to be the last one. Well, sure, if all the response seriously affecting the public, how does that show up by some kind of internal coherence? For instance, if you fake the values from the distribution and delete some of them non randomly, I would probably be able to see. I, I, Wonder whether you can ever assess, but just detail by distributions of things, whether the data is actually valid, whether its your findings are still, um, whether you can still make findings for it. I mean, I guess maybe that's uh, also part of the idea of these dissimilarity indices, where you're trying to compare the, the distribution of the pool of the respondents to the full sample, had you got the full sample. Obviously, it assumes that you have got fully observed information somewhere, let's say from a census or from a previous wave or something like that. So you can use these types of variables to assess that. Obviously, it will be always limited to these types of variables. You wouldn't be able to necessarily look at all the survey target variables, for example. So that's one limitation. But yeah, clearly, um, if you have that sort of internal information, you should be able to use it uh, to make some kind of assessment if there are uh, changes in the trends, for example, or something like well, that. Yeah. And so it may well be that you know, some of your low response rates are actually still perfectly valid because internally it's all quite coherent. You have nothing's jumping out at you, I don't necessarily even you, comparing with what you already know. I, I mean, that's my question. Can you, uh, ultimately, that's my question. Can you not assess whether low response is affected by looking internally at the range of distributions and variables? Well, for non-response bias, I think it would be difficult because... No, you, you wouldn't know, say that, well, no, you would, let, could you tell whether it was without bias by examining whether those variables behave according to the distributions you would expect them to follow? Well, I think the problem is that you didn't know what you wouldn't know what the expected uh, distribution should be unless you've got some external criterion mm -hmm. and, and then you're sort of back in the... I mean, I, so I don't, I don't think, you know, if your question is just by looking at the data that you have and making no external reference, there's, I don't see how you would be able to come to a judgment about whether something was biased or not, because bias by definition means re with, with reference to some true value. And most of our survey data actually is categorical variables. Um, mm. you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm particularly <laughs> much of a strong prior for them, except ex with reference to external. Okay, so if you have measurements, you would be able to see.